Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Fro Show. My name is Frank Mankin and I'm joined, as always, by my beautiful co-host, Joe Murray. Hello, Frank. And we are joined today by a very special guest, phenomenal artist and all-round awesome person, Michael Rossicelli. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm very excited to be here. I'm awesome. very excited that you're here. We yes. actually, this is probably like the third time that I've brought it up with you. Yes. And it's just never happened. But we're here, finally. Thank <laughs> goodness. Um, have you done a podcast before? No, I haven't. This is my first time. This is my premiere podcast. Your premiere podcast. Well, I think it's, I think personally, I am biased, but this is a good, <laughs> good place to start. I yes. think so. It's, if, we're not going to ask you deep questions. We're just going to vibe. Um, we, <laughs> we had an idea the other day mm -hmm. to paint while we did the podcast. Um, because we thought it'd be fun. Mm -hmm. But we got here today and immediately realized we have no idea what we're gonna paint. Yeah. So we thought that it would be fun mm -hmm. to do your creative process okay. and what you come up with and then we'll all paint the same thing. Okay. And do it that way. <laughs> and then all we right. can compare and contrast at the end. Okay. As professional artists <laughs> of different calibers. Um, well, Maybe a minor spanner in the works. Okay. okay. How do we feel about all doing self-portraits? That works. Ooh. I'm cool with that. Because then we can do something same vein, but different. Yeah, I like pressure. that. Yeah, all right, yeah, cool. Then I can put up my self-portrait of myself next to your self-portrait of you exactly. that I have. Yeah. Exactly. Hell yeah. Works okay, great. I'm, all, I'm actually stoked. Um, we also <laughs> only have primary colors and white and black. So we're going to do some color theory, yeah, um, which I'm a bit scared for <laughs> because I don't know my color theory. Well, it's a good thing you've been a professional. Good, yeah, good, I'm know. glad. Okay, you grab, you grab your colors first. I think that's right. a good idea. Yeah. Um, we have beautiful cardboard for you to mix it on. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, go wild. That, you can are they... I don't know if they're open. They're probably not, are they? No. You have to twist the, oh. Oh no, they're just little pop tops. Beautiful. We probably should have grabbed a bin, I think. That would have been a smart Maybe. idea. Just That's stick fine. it to the... Yeah, stick it to the cardboard. That's smart. All right, while we're opening them, um, Micah, do you want to talk a little bit about your artistic journey? Mm. Um, yes. So I've always painted and drawn um, since I was very, very young. Uh, did my Cert 3 in Visual Arts when I was in high school. Beautiful. Which was the best thing I ever did. Um, just to like get out of the classroom environment and go and learn somewhere else and get a bit more of like specialised yeah. education in it. Yeah. And that really made a lot clear in those last few years of school. Yeah. Um, and then I completely forgot all that and went and studied theatre. <laughs> uh, which was, you know, a choice. Well, look, um, I made the yeah. same choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I absolutely don't regret it because I've worked with so many people from yeah. the theatre industry through that course. Yeah. Like when you study theatre, when you study visual arts, you meet visual artists and yeah. curators. When you study theatre, you meet directors, writers, actors, set builders. Like yeah. You meet such a broad range yeah. of creatives. Um, so no regrets. Uh, and then, yeah realized halfway through that course it was not for me <laughs> um, and went back to visual arts and i've been doing that ever since nice yeah. so i would say it's been like four or five years of actually chasing it professionally yeah actively being yep oh yeah that's sick thanks so did you was that a conscious decision for you to be like i'm gonna be a visual artist now or uh yes yeah Yes, when I realised I didn't want to do anything else. Yeah. What was, that, what was that like, being like, okay, I need to commit to this now? Uh, exciting, scary, um, but it just felt correct. Yeah, I guess. you just knew. Yeah. Yeah, I was very frustrated with the jobs I had had um, and very prone to temper tantrums that I did. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't doing what I was loving. Yeah. Fair. So then, yeah, one day I decided I will have a difficult but fulfilling life <laughs> <laughs> be an artist. The creative that is the, that is the decision, isn't it? Yeah. Am I going to be comfortable or am I going to hate myself but also have a good time? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just getting right into it. Yeah, go for it. I was going to say, I have no idea where to start so, with this. Yes. The best way to start, mm -hmm. um, so obviously my work is all very, very colourful. Yeah. I like to go by a metric of how did I feel yesterday? How do I feel today? 
how do I want to feel tomorrow? Oh, that's oh, sick. Okay. Pick I a like colour for each of those emotions. Okay, mm. okay, okay. So like yesterday, you know, for example, yesterday I was happy, but very busy and very on the go. So I think I'm going to go with like a medium dark blue for that. Mm -hmm. Like calm, but not a relaxing sky blue. Still a little bit of... A little bit, little bit of angst. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little yeah, bit of yeah, yeah. colour in there. And then today I'm just feeling chill, so I'm going to go with like... Maybe a nice orange or a pink. Ooh. Mm. Um, and then tomorrow I want to be very exciting, so I'm going to go red. Okay, cool. Wow. Okay. okay. I got to think about mine yeah, now. No, I've already started with blue. <laughs> Look at this brush quality. It's just. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really good. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Wow. <laughs> okay. Tools never limit you. You can make <laughs> art with anything. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, what's yeah, the so Bo, Ban Bo Burnham quote? Every moment oh, can be remember. a comedic moment. Don't waste a moment. Yeah, maybe. That's good. Yeah. Anyway, totally unrelated. <laughs> okay, I think um, I'm gonna do a light blue for yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do a green for today because I'm feeling like growth mm -hmm. today. Ooh, yeah. And tomorrow I'm gonna be excited. So I'm gonna go for a, like a deep yellow. Yeah. Mm, nice. Interesting. Now, I will need um, color theory help to make green. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, what kind of green do you want? Like a like a foresty green. Foresty green. Yeah. Uh, start with two parts blue to one part yellow. Beautiful. I'll do a little tutorial. Oh, yeah. on how to mix. Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna start with my with my base coat though. Yes. So I like to mix with the knives. Yeah. I have some spares if you want to use. I was gonna ask, what's like the benefit to? Well, why do why do you choose knives over? brushes? Um, I used to be a perfectionist <laughs> um, and so when I was painting with brushes I wasn't ever finishing anything um. because you can always go back and blend and do more yeah. but with the knives it's so much texture and it's very much once it's on it's, it's there. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's just a way of like limiting how much I can be careful and yeah. limiting the perfection mm. of it like when it's impossible for it to be perfect you're not striving for that anymore. Yeah. Mm. So you get to have a lot more fun. Oh, color theory. Hell yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of like... Just mush it. Yeah. yeah. Push them into each other until you get the kind of color you want. So you've got a nice forest green there, but then a trick to make it even brighter. Throw in a color that's opposite. Ooh. Just a little bit. And then mix those in. And you get, see how the green just pops yeah. a little bit more now? Some real Whoa. art tips going on yeah. already. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> so because the colors mix, but those particles don't actually combine. Yeah. They're just so close together that our eyes can't perceive the difference. Right. right. And so by throwing in this little red, your brain is subconsciously picking up the bits of red within the green. Right. And it makes the green seem brighter than it is. Interesting. So would you say that you take a, a scientific approach to, to painting then? Yes. Yeah. Very much. Before art, I was going to go down a science path. Oh. Mm -hmm. That tracks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you do a lot of shows as well. Yes. What's the process like for that? Because I know that some of them are very, you're actively working towards a show, like you're, you're specifically creating pieces for it. Mm -hmm. But then you've also got shows where it's kind of just like you're, th you're throwing together some stuff that you've put together over the past, you know, six months, 12 months. Yeah. Like what's your curation process like? Um, I am a firm believer in a research-based practice. Yeah. So that's where, you know, you start with a topic or a theme you want to explore and do massive amounts of research so you know the topic in and out. Yeah. And then you can make the work based on that. Mm. So it's kind of like building a strong enough foundation that when you get to the actual painting part, you can just be chaotic and wild because yeah. you've got it yeah. all You've got the baseline. Mm. Um, so I normally pick, yeah, a line of research and go through that. Yeah. And so then, you're kind of writing your artist statements before you even yes. start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the opposite of that is um, like you said, the work that I just do in between those shows where I'm just painting and yeah. having fun and yeah. being an idiot. Um, that's the kind of stuff 
where it's like, oh, in six months I'll just show everyone the other things lying around my studio, the yeah. more fun stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of like a film and a behind the scenes. Yeah. Mm. Is the comparison. Yeah, right. That makes sense. That's really cool. I like that a lot, actually. Just being, having that analytical approach, but then also having that more calm, mm -hmm. you know, here's the things I've made. Yeah. All right, I've got my base coat down. Nice. How are you going over there, Joe? Me. Uh, I'm concentrating too, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I should have put more thought into this before I came today. <laughs> Done a couple practice runs. Yeah. <laughs> I do love that we've all started with some form of blue. Yeah. But it's all immediately great. so different. <laughs> that's very interesting. Um, I have to think about what I look like now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the bit I'm worried about. <laughs> all right. So that's the beauty of art. You can look like anything. But then is it still a self-portrait? Well, therein lies the philosophical that, that's question. That's where it gets philosophical. All art is self-portraiture. Ooh. How philosophical do you like to get with your art? Oh, incredibly. I relish in it. Yeah? Yeah. Self-aware of how gratuitous it can be. Yeah. But yeah, I love to go high camp. Like, yeah. Yeah, I love art that's very philosophical and introspective. Even... You know, sometimes when I want to roll my eyes at other people's yeah. philosophical yeah. statements, I still love that they do it. Yeah. I think it's so much fun to just make something. <laughs> You're like, this is stupid, but I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah, yeah, very much. <laughs> like, remember the, um, the banana on the wall yeah. that went viral? I love that. I'm yeah. obsessed with it. <laughs> because it filled its purpose. Yeah. Everybody spoke about nothing but that banana yeah. for a full 48 hours. Yeah. Which yeah. in this day and age... Is, is a feet and a half, uh -huh. genuinely. I should have brought a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, hang on. We have cameras. Oh, yeah. Oh, Good yeah. Luck. What are there we go. Mirror? Okay, I know where I'm starting now. <laughs> <laughs> Start with my big old gazongas nose. There we go. <laughs> Gone right, right down the middle. A All good right. place to start. That's it, my self portrait's done. Yeah. That's how I see myself. <laughs> So what's been your, um, your favourite moment in your artistic career so far? Ooh, Big question. You can also yeah, make it like yeah. anything remotely related. Um, I would say my first uh, successful solo show. What was that? Uh, Please Don't Be My Valentine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, from 2020. That was the first show that I did that I really felt like yeah. there's nothing I would change tonight. Yeah. Looking back on it again, like a few days and months later, of course there's things to change. Yeah, but while you were there... You in were... the moment, it was like, I'm completely at peace with what this is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that was the first time that I was able to like fully stand by what I had made and be like, yeah, I'm happy with it. Yeah. I was at that show, actually. I think that mm -hmm. was the one that I've been to. Mm -hmm. I still think about that um, Bacchus painting. Yes. Constantly. Yes. That is like the, the painting of yours that is just constantly on my mind. Yeah, a crowd favourite for sure. Yeah? Is that, does Some, that yeah. come Sometimes up a lot? you do a painting and you're like, you know this is this is the one. Yeah. Um, and for that show that was definitely it. Yeah. Have you had many like that? Uh, I think every show has one. Yeah. Like one or two that I call the hero pieces. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, this encapsulates the entire theme of the show yeah whether the audience knows that or not is up to them but, but at least for me it's like yeah. that's your your kind of realization yeah yeah right that makes sense that there's there's constantly one mm -hmm. that pops out oh. so with your curation yes and like coming up with pieces for a show like that mm. what's your like What's your process? What's your number one thing that you're like, this is what I'm looking for when I'm creating pieces for um, a show like that? I've definitely realised how much a theatre background has affected my practice. Yeah. Because um, I definitely focus on things like motif and story yeah. and setting. So normally when I start the process, I look at the themes... Um, and then I look at how I can make a story out of that yeah. through imagery and re repetition. So oftentimes, um, like my most recent show, Symbiosis, 
was very linear. Yeah. So it was creating characters and picking like four inanimate objects as images mm. that represent the story at different yeah. times. Um, and then kind of building it around that. So looking at the curation process kind of like kind of like um, thumbnails of a film plot. What's that called? Yeah, storyboard. Storyboard, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kind of like a storyboard where it's like, well, what order would this occur in? Yeah, right. Um, but when I curate other people's shows, it's much more focused on the visuals um, yeah. and more of a colour theory focus. Yeah, so you're, you're thinking how would a person walk into this and what would that, yes. how would that affect them? Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So it's kind of like set dressing for a show versus actually coming up with the themes for a show. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 What experience do you want people to have and how do you make that happen yeah. without them knowing it's happening? Yeah, right. So your, your theatre background obviously makes a big difference mm -hmm. in how you view that then. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you feel like that comes up in, in any other parts of your actual art other than the actual curation? Uh, oh, definitely. It's, my art is always very theatrical. Yeah. <laughs> in <its laughs> themes. Um, yeah, I think, I think it does. Like, I'm constantly thinking of, like, within that theatre framework of what is this painting's motivation? Yeah. Where is it going? What's the, like, what's the theme? What's its... Yeah. Yeah. Right. What's it trying to say? Yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever make something that you think is going to say one thing and then it's finished and you look at it and go, oh, this is like taking a, a life of its own? Oh, all the time. Yeah? Yeah. Constantly. What's, yeah. The, what's been the re most recent version of that? Um, oh. That's a tough question. <laughs> um, it's kind of a weird experience because you go into it thinking you're making one thing. Yeah. And then you step back and sometimes it takes hours to months. And then you realise what you've subconsciously put into right. what you've been making and it's yeah. suddenly like speaking back to you, which sounds very... <laughs> very um, artist pretentious yeah. Yes. Yeah, I get what yes. you're saying. Um, but yeah, I think my last solo show, Symbiosis, um, it had a lot to do with um, trauma and the science behind trauma response. Yeah. And why humans react the way they do to certain things. Yeah. Um, what, was, was, what was the research like for that show then? Uh, quite intense. Yeah. Um, yeah, my other shows have been a bit more clinical. Like, Please Don't Be My Valentine was about the history of Valentine's Day and why we have it. Yeah. And then Lend Me Your Touch was while we were all in lockdown, was looking at the science of physical contact, why we need it, mm. all that stuff. But researching trauma was very much like, it felt more tangible. Yeah. Because it wasn't just looking at chemicals and famous people and yeah. history. It was looking at like events and things that affect people. Yeah, right. Um, but I chose to tell the story through the process of a... Um, caterpillar metamorphosizing into a butterfly. Oh, that's cool. Um, but within the story was, um, I was inspired by the alien film. There's a parasitic wasp yeah. that lays its eggs inside a caterpillar oh. and um, poisons the caterpillar's brain. So the caterpillar thinks it has to protect these eggs right. and protect the wasp. So it was this, like telling the experience of trauma but through, through this story of, of a caterpillar that you know you're following the story wondering is it gonna get the chance to metamorphosize or is it gonna become the wasp host mm, right um so luckily i think the research was a bit alleviated because i also had that on the side of it i had a story yeah to put it through um, but yeah, some quite intense research. Yeah, which... that feels like something that you'd, you'd step back from and be like, okay, I need like a day or two to just recompose. Yes. yes. And really piece everything together. Which I wasn't expecting. So yeah, I finished that show and stepped away from it. And when it was done, that was kind of the slap in the face I got from that one was like, oh, yeah, no, I've made a show about something completely different. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've made a show about like my experience researching the topic. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it became this very like meta experience. Of like <laughs> just experiencing it through the experience itself. Yes, yeah. 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 
That's what you want though. You want those meta experiences of like, you look back and you realize kind of what you've done. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's a, a common experience for a lot of artists to look back and have a completely different outlook on their piece? Or do you think a lot of people are a lot more analytical with how they actually come at a painting um, or, a, or a piece in general? It's honestly a, a, such a wide array. Yeah. Like no two artists work the same. Um, I think it's a very good idea to be able to look back on your work and rip it to shreds. Yeah. I think it's a healthy thing to be able to judge yourself under that lens. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important for artists to, you know, do their research, give your show the legs to stand on. Yeah. Because you want to give yourself as much opportunity to defend your work as possible. Yeah. Because that's just part of the game. Like, people are going to question what you make because um, that's the experience of an artist. People who don't make art are going to be like, why? Well, yeah, they're, they're not going to understand it and they want to understand it. Yeah. Um, and so if you can give yourself that platform of like, well, I know what I'm trying to say. I've got, you know, the 8,000 word essay of research behind it. Yeah. And it's just backing up your, your research then. Yes. Right. Have you ever had any, like, anything that you've given or shown an audience that, and they've kind of taken it as something different? Uh, oh yeah, all the time. Yeah. And I guess then have you, do you see that, or, you know, I've always had this argument of like, is art something, is it interpreted correctly the way the artist wants it to be interpreted or the way the audience interprets it, uh, in your opinion? There's no wrong way to interpret it, I yeah, think. Okay. I work under the idea that once I put something on the walls, it doesn't completely belong to me anymore. Yeah. yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what I wanted to make if someone else sees it, has an experience because they saw it. Mm. It's not my place to then step in and be like, oh, well, that's not what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And, like, ruin that. Yeah. yeah. Like, the whole point of art, and I think the art world would be better if people were more vulnerable to just feeling things, seeing something, letting it affect them, thinking about it. Mm. And when you try and cut through that with your message... It's a little bit of a negative reinforcement of like, oh, well, I don't care what you think as an audience member. Yeah. You don't get it. This is what I was trying to say. Right. Yeah. So I'm constantly like, if you see something in my painting and it triggers something in your brain that makes you connect some dots, mm. I'm happy. Yeah. I don't care what dots you connect. Yeah, that's your, your job you think yeah. is complete at that yeah. point. Because also the things I make are for me as well. So it's, I don't always want to be like, well, this is what I actually meant. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm more than happy for things to be just things that I know. Yeah. Do you have any pieces like that that have been totally differently interpreted, but you'd rather leave it that way? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. I rarely ever correct people on their yeah. interpretations unless they ask specifically, specifically what for I meant. your. Yeah. yeah. Right. Do you feel like that's a. a positive in your work then to be able to have people have completely different experiences oh absolutely yeah yeah because i think it says something about the work if this person was able to make a connection that i didn't even know existed yeah right and so i love to get their input of what they felt and then go with them on that journey and like question why did it make you feel that way let's talk about that yeah like what's how... been what's been the most interesting version of that that you've had where someone's told you an interpretation and you've gone, you know, that's A, not at all what I would have thought could have come mm. out of it, and B, you were somewhat inspired by their experience with your piece. Um, probably would have been in my Lend Me Your Touch show. Yeah. I had a painting called To Be Held, um, which when I made it, I wanted to capture both feelings of longing and possession. Yeah. Um, and that feeling of like wanting something so badly that you hold it too tightly. Yeah. Kind of feeling. Um, and then the person who bought it said that they felt this unconditional sense of love from it. Right. Which is, I totally. thought, and I thought about that in my mind so much and it came to the conclusion of like, that is never the words I would use to describe it but mm. we were kind of describing the same experience. Yeah. And so I just, think that was a really interesting one because it was like, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's because your, their experience of that very close to the chest kind of love mm. was very different to yours? Yeah, absolutely. 
And that's the beauty of it is like, you know, you start a conversation and you can see where you differ. Yeah. And you can discuss how you both got to that conclusion. Mm. That's really interesting. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked that at all. No. That someone would interpret it you know, in literally the exact opposite way of mm -hmm. the intended, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's the fun of it. That how, is the fun of it. How yeah. the self portraits going? They are my, look, oh, mine's going great. really well. <laughs> Let's all Let's <laughs> Ooh. show. Yeah, that's the that's the camera, at. the main camera in the middle there. This all is right. this is mine. Update. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going well. Now that we have some time. strong bases, I'll give you some some portrait advice. Okay. Yes. So faces have things we call planes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So the forehead is a flat rectangular plane, mm -hmm. the nose is a skinny rectangular plane, the cheeks are little triangles. Mm -hmm. So now that you have a base, it's about looking at where those planes are. So like just right. using yours as an example, choose whatever you want to be your lightest colour yeah. and just focus on hitting where the light would hit on those planes. Right. Oh. And just Start with geometric shapes, yeah, and then those shapes get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you can't see the shape and you just see a painting. Mm. Oh. Okay, okay. This is right. this is this is good advice. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like you know what you're doing or something. That's, well, <laughs> that's <know>. so crazy. <laughs> You'd bloody hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like your journey as a as a professional artist mm. at this point is what you envisioned it when you started, or um, do you think that it's changed? as time's gone on? I, I kind of went into it with no plan. Yeah. No idea what was gonna happen, no idea what's coming next, which has been a very positive experience. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a hard question, cause it's like, well, I like what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, can't say it's what I envisioned I would be doing. Yeah. Um, I definitely didn't think I would be a full-time artist this early. Yeah. Um, so I think that's been the biggest shock and the biggest adjustment is learning how do I kill the hobby and make this a job. Yeah, right. Um, and what, like, where's the ethics there? Like, when do I stop loving this? Yeah. Or how much do I need to give it for it to succeed? What's too much? Yeah. Because obviously you still want to enjoy it and stand by it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think that's been the biggest learning curve. Is that, that, yeah. Right. That makes total sense, actually. So do you feel like in having made it a full-time job, mm. you've, do you feel like you've lost anything from the hobby side at all? Um, I feel like it's lost a little bit of the frivolity. Yeah. It's not so much like, this is just a thing for me. Yeah. I still very much enjoy it, don't get me wrong. Um, it's definitely like a pros, an impossible pros and cons. Yeah. Well, there's so many pros that outweigh the cons. Yeah. It's really hard to compare. But I yeah. think it, it did just lose that kind of therapeutic come home from a day of work yeah. and just get lost in this that yeah. no mm. one has to see and just have fun. Yeah. It's now specifically the thing that you're actively working on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like... Whether I want to or not, I have to wake up today and make X, Y, Z. Yeah. And think about this and do that. Do you feel like your creativity is, is sort of stifled by that in a sense? Uh, that, you're, that you're not entire, you're now focused entirely on it needing to be done today rather than being like, I'm in a creative mood in this moment? Uh, not so much. I think it, the big change that had to happen was learning how to manipulate creativity and inspiration, how yeah. I'm feeling. Yeah. And like with your before today, after yes. thing that we started with. Yes. Yeah, precisely. So it's like, you know, giving yourself those buffers and tools to help you always be able to whip something out. Yeah. Uh, knowing when to stop and when to rest is a big one. Yeah. What What's that look like for you? Uh... The frustration. Yeah. <laughs> Normally. Yeah. When it's like, you know, you've gone over the same thing three or four times and you're just not getting it. Yeah. And the hardest thing is to just step away and give it time. Yeah. But you always come back and immediately see what you have to do when yeah. you just give it that day. Suddenly it clicks. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah, come back with fresh eyes and all that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's so much losing anything. I just think it's shifting the goalposts, yeah. changing how you think about it. Yeah, okay. So you don't feel like you've lost anything. It's just that you're now paying specific attention to how yes. you're feeling on a particular day, how that affects the art itself. Yes. And that, would that impact what pieces you're working on a specific day then? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can generally gauge about 30 minutes into the day <laughs> what kind of art I'm going to make. <laughs> Once you're day. actually conscious. Yeah. Yeah. I generally know like, oh, actually, <laughs> actually I might not do that very nice commission. <laughs> I might make something angry. Yeah. <laughs> and you do a lot of complete left turn here. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of Twin Peaks stuff as well. Yes. Do you feel like that's a, a big influence on you, not just as an artist, but also as a person? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What is it about it that has stuck with you um, so long? <laughs> I guess I watched, the first time I watched Twin Peaks, and it was the first David Lynch work I'd ever seen. Yeah. I would have been like 16 or 17. And it was the first time that I'd watched something that was like, arresting in that way right where so it was immediately like, sucked into it yes yeah and it was also kind of my introduction into this like semi art house form yeah right of learning like oh pop culture media can be more than just you know buffy the vampire slayer or love island which, you know. <laughs> it has its place in yeah in don't art. get me wrong i'm a big buffy fan yeah <laughs> um so yeah i think we live in an age where Pop what? culture and pop media is uh, unavoidable. Yeah. It's always yeah. there. And so why not draw inspiration from it? Yeah. Because, um, you know, it affects us in our day-to-day -day lives. We don't get away from it. I think there's kind of a misconception that it's shallow to focus on your pop culture references. Yeah. Um, I completely disagree. Yeah, so you'd be an advocate for people yeah. being more involved in their own pop culture. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's... Understanding? It's, yeah, it's kind of like the, the Paris salon of the day of like, you know, this is what affects people en masse the most. Yeah. Like, we don't have the Globe Theatre with Shakespeare anymore. Yeah. Like they did back then, but that completely affected and changed theatre and performance. Yeah. Um, so I right. think it's the same. So yeah, Twin Peaks was a massive effect because it's so camp... And so, yeah. like, so joyful and so horrifying at the same time. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd seen someone, like, smash together these completely different characters and emotions and feelings. Yeah. And make something that is beautiful and horrifying and just kind of this understanding of, like, this wouldn't work without every moving piece that's in it. Yeah. And carrying that into my art of realising... That was the first time I realised, like, you can build an experience. Yeah, everything's connected. Yes. Right. So um, that, that was definitely a really big part of your creative journey, was having that realisation. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was discovering Twin Peaks alongside discovering Radiohead at the same time. Yeah. Which they do the same with music. Yeah. Right. And the so a while ago, um, we did a shoot together where I kind of followed you for the day and just did a day in the life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, when we did that, a lot of your mood setting and kind of understanding of your emotion for that day was, was based around music. Yes. Um, is, it, is that still the case? Do you yeah, still yeah, yeah. spend a lot of time with music? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I do this thing now where while I'm working on a solo show, I make a playlist for that show. So like while I'm doing the research part, I'll find the music that I listen to while doing the research. Mm. Add that all into a playlist. So it's, I've kind of got the same soundtrack the entire time I'm working on it. Yeah. So even when I get lost in the zone and you know, you enter that beautiful flow state yeah. where you lose time, Yeah. there's still that very real tether of yeah. like, this is all familiar, I know this yeah. song, I've listened to it the whole time. And you associate that music with working on this, mm. and yeah. it's a good way to enter that headspace. Right. right. Interesting. I'm always looking at ways to hack <laughs> getting into hack that, that psychological. Workspace. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. And that's, I guess that's another way, like you said earlier, of like how do you wake up and get to work and stay on it? 
that's it's having your... that psychological trigger of like, yep, this is my work music, this is my work headspace, yeah. this is the routine and the ritual. Yeah, that's how you kind of establish that creative space. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that something that you'd recommend for everyone or is that kind of just a, a way that you, you um, get I there? think everyone has different modes of doing it. Yeah. But I think it's a very good thing that everyone should do. Maybe it's not music for some people, maybe it's an outfit or... Yeah. I mean, you've got your painting outfit. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I need a new one very heavily, soon. Heavily worn and used. Yeah, I need a new one. It also smells rank. Because <laughs> I refuse to wash any of this paint off. I mean, it's, I feel like it has its own aesthetic at this point that yeah. you, just, yes. you can't afford to, to change. Yes, it's the jumpsuits world. I just live in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How much do you think your kind of general life experience up to this point has impacted your work? Oh, very heavily. Yeah. yeah. What do you think is the biggest kind of impact of your life that you see constantly coming up as themes through your work? Um... I think growing up, I felt very much like an outsider. Yeah. Whether I actually was or not is up for debate. Because um, looking back, it's like, oh, no, you didn't really have it that rough. But I remember, <laughs> like, you, like, growing up, everybody at some point feels like, oh, everyone hates me. Everyone hates me. I'm yeah. a freak. I'm a fraud. Oh, my God. No one understands me. Yeah. That very teenage emotion. Yeah. Um, I'm a freak. I'm a weirdo. Yeah. But I guess, like, constantly feeling like, being a bit of a weirdo and being on the outside, embracing that as the best vantage point to look in and see what other people don't. Yeah. So, like, I think that's why I'm drawn very much to psychological themes and a lot of sociology. Yeah. Is because I think that's the biggest effect it's had is, like, from an objective stance, here's what I see about the world. Yeah. Um, and here's the science to back that up. Yeah. Because I guess it's definitely one of those things where you can't see it when you're in it. Yeah. Like, people make comments about the art world all the time, which are things that I don't notice at all. Yeah. Because I'm entrenched in it. Just like I look at, you know, the nine to five working world. Yeah. And have zero understanding of it. Yes. Yeah. You can't be like, you, you're like, how can you sit there and, and actively be engaged in your work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What are your working hours like as a as an artist? Uh, do they um, change? Do you keep yourself on a schedule? Chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do try and keep a schedule. I'm getting better at it. Um, of like, yeah, organising my days and organising my weeks. Uh, the best thing I've done recently is implementing a content day. Yep. Mm. Where that is the day where I do, you know, what things that will go into reels and what my story posts will be. Yeah. So that's really alleviated a lot of the pressure because then I'm not waking up on any given day like, oh, shit, I have to make something for the Instagram. Yeah. Um, so I can just get that all out in one day and then I've got the other six days to just work on my actual yeah. work. Because yeah. um, I don't like to post things to the gram until they've shown in real life normally. Right. That's interesting. Because um, that's something that I don't have in my work. M all my work is digital up to yes, this point. Yes. So you're actively keeping those pieces off of Instagram or off of social media in general. Yes. Until they've been shown. Yes. Right. Yeah. If it's like a piece that's standalone and I know it's not going to be a major part of a solo show. Yeah. I'm normally fine posting that. Um, but if it's something that I know is going to be part of a solo exhibition... You'll hold on to it. I hold on to it because I want people to have that experience in real life. Yeah. Mm. I don't want them to see it on Instagram, come to a show three months later and be like, oh, yeah, I liked that. Yeah. yeah. Like, I saw it for three seconds on my phone, so I'm going to give it the same amount of attention here. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Whereas mm. when they see it in real life, they have time to absorb it, and then three weeks later they see it on their phone, and they get to be like, oh, this piece, I saw it. Yeah. Now I get to zoom in, look at it, experience it again. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah, that makes... So much sense. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's one of the things that I really miss as a, a predominantly digital artist is that physicality of my work. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that if I was to show my work, I'd want it to be just like massive. Yes. Like just massive prints. Yes. And that's time consuming. Oh yeah, for sure. And expensive. Uh, very expensive. Oh. Remarkably so. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, if people want to know why art is so expensive to buy, <laughs> just know that we're taking very little profit. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that is literally just paying to yeah. get it on a wall. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on a project at the moment that I haven't actually talked about <gasps> here yet. But um, I've been working on um, creative journals for um, creative people in general. So mm -hmm. um, helping with project management, because one of the biggest things that I see in a lot of artists is that lack of organization and yes. planning. Yes. And so I've been working towards that and I'm trying to figure out how to price it um, because to print them is $16 yep. and to ship them is like $4 a book to yep. me and then I have to ship it there. So yep. it's like, do I price it at 30 bucks, which is reasonable, yep. but I take like $6 off yes. the top yeah. or do I price it at something that's actually worthwhile for me? Well then, and I then think another metric you have to think of, which is something that rocked my world, how many hours would you estimate have you worked on creating this? Yes, mm. and how many hours and how many dollars are you gonna put into advertising it? Yes, I remember I bought a piece of an artist, um, a beautiful piece, it's one of my favorites in my collection. Um, and it was, you know, without divulging too much, it was triple figures, but on the low end. Yeah. Um, and ridiculous cheap for what it is. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke to the artists afterwards and I asked them like, oh, you know, how much were your materials? How many hours did you spend on it? Blah, 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 blah. And it ended up that they were paying themselves $2.50 an hour. Oh my goodness. For what they had made. And it's kind of like, that's why... Y that's why stuff costs the, what it yeah, does. You yeah, gotta yeah. Like, you gotta respect yourself and think of it. You gotta yeah. not think, how do I price this so someone buys it? Yeah. That mm. is the worst trap you can fall into. Yeah, and it's also that thing of, you know, the price will also indicate its value. So people are yes. going to pay that price. Yes. Just because and one yeah. person is interested and can't afford it doesn't mean that no one is interested. Precisely, and it is kind of an unfortunate thing about the capitalist hell that we live in. Yeah. Is like, unfortunately, the price, money is all people have to understand the value of something. Yeah. Like they don't, humans don't think beyond that. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you could show identical paintings side by side. One is $15, one is $1,500. Yeah. People are going to try to see why the $1,500 one is worth more. Yeah. Rather than thinking about, oh, maybe they put more time in it or the materials yes. are more expensive or X, Y, Z. Because that's just the metric that people understand. It's like, okay, more dollar, more value. I'm going to make myself see where that is more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like as your value on your art has gone up, that's become easier for you to price it? Or? Uh, it's definitely its own little skill yeah. that you have to work on is like how to price your art. Yeah. I still struggle with it. Um, and you know, there are times where, you know, it's a, times are a bit more tough. And so very few times someone will get in touch about a commission and you do have to think like, well, I do need to pay my rent. Yeah. Like, do I want to price this for what it's worth or do I want, it, like you said, like rent's due in two days. Do I want to just be able to pay my rent? And so sometimes yeah. you do have to make that hard choice. Yeah. Um, have but, you yeah. lost many potential commissions that way by pricing as what you need? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know. It sucks, but it is what it is. Yeah. And it's generally no hard feelings from the buyer. Yeah. I think it's important for artists to remind themselves like you have the power in this relationship. Yeah. You are not disappointing anyone by yeah. pricing your work what it should be. And if you are disappointing them, they're not people who should be buying art. Yeah. If they don't understand that the you're price, price it, yeah. how you're going to price it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's been your, your worst experience <coughs> so far? All right. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. So for my first um, solo show of 2020, Valentine, uh -huh. Um, you would remember it. I had a wall of like 12 framed paperwork. Yes. That were like 70 bucks each. Yeah. And those were my, every show I try to have a mid range demographic. Yeah. I call them my student prices. Yeah. Where it's like, I want to always have shows where people can walk in and they can get something. Yeah. That like everyone can buy a piece of art here tonight. There's yeah. things for expensive crowds and there's things where it's like, yeah, I have 60 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, those are the ones where I'm willing to take the hit. Yeah. Or I can make 60 bucks work. Yeah, exactly. So, I always like to have those. So, I had 12 of them, and these were like, these are ones where it's like, I know 
these are for my friends, essentially. Like, friends yeah. and people who are my age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are where I'm going to have, like, very nice experiences selling these. And I had someone come in for a preview of the show. Because mm -hmm. um, it was someone I'd been working with. And so I let him come in the day of to see the show. And then he said he wanted to buy something before he even got there. So I kind of gave him a tour and I was pointing him towards things that were in his price range. Yeah. And then he saw this wall of these paperworks and was like, these are beautiful. I want to take six of them. Okay. Oh. And I was like, well, I'm not going to say no yeah. to a sale. But in my heart, I was like, oh. Yeah. Because no. <laughs> that's yeah. six less people that are going to be able to buy something at their, yeah, at range. their price level. Yeah. And there were things that I knew certain people would like. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, this is a difficult position. I kind of have to be like, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And so he took like objectively the best ones and was like, uh, that's <laughs> fine. Um, and so then on the night, sold the rest of them, but so many people came up to me just so distraught. Because oh, really? the one they wanted was sold and it's all they can afford. Right. And there was all night I was getting people like, when are you making more of these? Yeah. How can I commission one? And I just felt so terrible the whole night. Oh. Yeah, right. I cut to one week later. Oh, no. Oh, keep uh, I messaged my little old pal and I'm like, hey, please give me your delivery address. Like, I need to send you these pieces. Mm. And then he was like, oh, I'm not really feeling them. No. Oh, no. And I was kind of like, oh, really? And he was like, yeah, I kind of, um, I didn't want to commit to one of the larger ones and I wish I had followed your advice and gotten one of the larger works because now I don't really want these little ones. I wish I'd bought this other one that had since sold to someone else. Yeah. And I was like, well, that sold you, Mr. Chance. Yeah, sucks to be you, sorry. Um, do you want these or not? And then he said, if you give them to me, they'll probably just end up in the bin. Oh. oh. And I was like, oh. Then why did you buy them? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was just this really awkward encounter of like, okay, so not only did you cost me six sales yeah. on the night, uh, you now don't even want them. Yeah. When I had people like... Actively asking for People them. like begging for them. Wow. Yeah. Like who were just like, please, I'll take a print of it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so it was just super offensive. And so I was like, okay, well, what do you want to do about it? And he was like, oh, well, you know, I've already given you the money. I'm sure you can find a way to make that up to me. Oh, oh And goodness. I was like, no, I don't no. owe you anything. Take I've... the money. And so I sent him, I transferred a refund back and then messaged him like, no, I don't know you a thing. You're not like, this is not your back door into getting work off me. Yeah. Uh, I've already refunded you the money. Please feel free to not come to my shows ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so he's just immediately on your blacklist. Yeah, fully. Yeah. And yeah, no contact after that. Yeah. Um, and then I went through the very difficult process of like trying to find those people who were keen. Yeah. yeah. And hand them off, which I got most of them rehomed. Yeah. Luckily, a few good. people had expressed interest in certain ones. Good, good. Um, so I was at, luckily able to contact them and be like, hey, the, surprise, this has become available. <laughs> mm -hmm. So turning it into a positive experience of like, oh, that thing you thought you missed out on? Surprise. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Do you often actually have to go back, or do you, do you go back and repaint like stuff again for uh, people who missed out, or not really? No, I don't like to replicate my work. Yeah, definitely not in that way. Yeah, like sometimes I'll repaint something that I want to repaint. Yeah, but uh, the feeling's gone. Yeah, when someone's like, "Oh, can you please recreate this for me?" It's like, you know, from a friend to a friend standpoint, I would love to. Mm. But as an artist? As an artist, like, no. Yeah. yeah. Like, because it, it won't be the same. Mm. Yeah. It won't come from the same place. Do you find that's hard to separate the art and the friend? Uh, how so? As in people that aren't in the art world who are asking for pieces or are asking for your work. Yes. Do you find it's hard to explain those things to them? To be uh, like, you know, no, that was actually how I was feeling that day. and It can be. Luckily, my close circle is very understanding Good. and willing to learn. And, like, you know, it's been some years now. Yeah. Definitely in the early days, uh, it was harder to explain, but I also didn't know what I was doing then. Yeah. So I would just say yes to stuff like that. Yeah. So it was kind of like we all learned side by side of, like, oh, no, it doesn't actually work as well when I force it. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, it's definitely hard to explain. I'm at, at a point now where it's like, again, understanding I have the power in the relationship. So just being like, no, these are my rates. Yeah. If you can't afford it, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's look at other options. Do you want to go smaller? Do you need a payment plan? Yeah. Like, so definitely letting them know what your boundaries are, but also offering them a solution. Yeah. That's really interesting because I haven't heard anyone say that, but the, that you have the power in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, is that something that you've worked out or is that something that you've heard from someone? Uh, it's definitely something I learned yeah. through those hard lessons of like what happened with those pieces. Yeah. Um, and then like saying yes to jobs that definitely did not pay me enough because I thought I just had to say yes to an, like, yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, because you're like, when am I going to get the next one? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's definitely something I've learned over time. It's also like realising remembering like I am, like I said before, entrenched in the art world. I know how it works. I know how I work. Yeah. People who are not artists don't. Yeah. And so it also comes with a little bit of forgiveness and a chance to teach them. Yeah. Where it's like, like hey, this is actually how this, this yeah. works. Because people obviously aren't coming to you trying to be... Dickheads. <laughs> yeah, trying to <laughs> rot you. And so it's just like finding gentle ways of being like, oh no, well it it actually works like this, and yeah. I don't take this, and yeah, you know. And again, offering the solution of like, here's how it would work ideally for me. What's the yeah. middle ground? What works for you? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's just a little bit of humility and remembering like, yeah, it's completely fair that you think it works this way. Yeah, because that's all you've seen in media. Yeah. Do you feel like that? Happens a lot that you that a certain like is there a certain stereotype that you see come up a lot? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> What's the number one for you? Uh, that you that you get a lot and you immediately go, Oh, I know where this is from. Uh it's definitely like the supply and demand metric. Yeah. Again, of capitalism. Where people can't understand like, but I'm offering you money. <laughs> so yeah. why won't you give me product? Yeah. Like I'm this is money <laughs> and, and you can paint so please paint my dog and it's like mm, i don't paint dogs though <laughs> like you know it's very much like going to mcdonald's and asking for a pizza like yeah, well, yeah. it's not gonna happen i could but also it would suck so yeah exactly i get um my most recent rule with my commissions is no family members Oh, interesting. Um, Where did that spawn from? Well, I was getting a lot of people like, hey, can you paint my mom or like Father's Day? Can you yeah. paint my dad or my siblings? And it's just like, no, because I don't know them. <laughs> yeah, um, you won't be able to catch, uh, capture them in that. Yeah, like, a, you know, a lovely family photo is great, but like, I'm never going to be able to capture the essence of your family because I haven't lived with your family for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, and it's also like, look at my work. Mm, yeah. like, like a lot of it is very chaotic. Yeah. Like, are you sure you want me to paint your mum the way I would paint? <laughs> the way that I paint? Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely think that that's... That's also a difficult thing to explain to someone. Yes. It's like, you're, yeah. like, yes, you are an artist, but I'm not that kind of artist. Yeah, I'm an artist, I'm not a printer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like how um, one of the big things that I've always said is I don't want to shoot weddings. Yes. Um, and I am technically shooting a wedding coming up, but only because it's a friend yep. and it's um, candids. They just want yep. candids and portraiture, yep. which is what I can do. I can do that. Yeah, finding the middle ground. Yeah. But if they'd gone, I want detail shots, I want wedding dresses, mm -hmm. I want... And I'm like, I can't, I don't have the, the ability for that. Yeah. Yeah. We have um, about 10 minutes left, just so that you're oh, aware. Amazing. <laughs> I should be done in 10 minutes. Beautiful. How long does it take for you to normally do a, a painting? I guess? About an hour and five minutes. I was going to uh, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, literally, yeah. <laughs> uh, generally, this size is, yeah, 40 minutes to an hour. Yeah. When I'm not, you know, being a podcast starlet <laughs> yeah. and having a chat, I could, you know, 30 minutes. Yeah. yeah right. That's the other benefit of the palette knives mm. is you can work quite fast. Yeah. Um, which is definitely the name of the game going full time was learning. Yeah. How do I keep my work good, good 
but also work with purpose and work efficiently. Yeah. Um, and that's just something that came with time, mm -hmm. I assume. Yeah. And again, like having the playlist and setting yourself in the zone. Yeah. You have those subconscious triggers of like, oh, okay, this song's playing, so I know I've been painting for about X amount of time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that that's actually really smart. <laughs> <laughs> so it is the same playlist every time you said. Uh, yeah, like for like specific shows. I yes. Mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the same yeah. kind of array of playlists. Yeah. Right. Are you still rocking the Skull Candy headphones, or have you upgraded since? Uh, no, I uh, am currently headphoneless. <gasps> yes, I tried to get some um, wireless in-ear ones. Yeah. yeah, I broke the Skull Candies. Oh, naturally. <laughs> yeah, um, and they just kept messing up, and so I went, you know what? Fuck it. My neighbors are gonna hear me roar. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just play my music like in the studio. Yeah, um, which has actually been a much better vibe. Yeah, because I can hear the studio and the music, which I didn't yeah. think would make a big difference. But it clearly has. Yeah, because it just like puts, getting very theatre student here. <laughs> it puts the music in the space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which gen like genuinely has made a difference. <laughs> um, no, I got paint all on the inside of those skull candies. Which oh. dried into like where the into sound this, comes yeah. out. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. That's yeah. awesome. That's really cool. I'm sure that yeah. they loved that. Oh yeah. Look, <laughs> since moving into a rental, I've become much cleaner. Yeah, yeah I'm, much I'm sure. More calm. <laughs> What's your studio set up like now? Uh, I was very lucky to get a ridiculously cheap two bedroom. Beautiful. In Cooperu, so I have a bedroom. Uh, nice. And the other bedroom is my studio. Very good. So it's fully tarped on the floor. Ooh. Because I want my bond back. Yes. Yeah. Um, Understandable. And then I've lined the walls with cardboard from uh, paint supply orders. Yeah. Um, so that there's as little chance as possible of getting paint on the walls. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, trying to give myself that protection. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, my studio is very purposely set up in a circular form. Yeah. So I have like my drawing desk and my small paintings desk yep. to my supplies section yeah and then behind me is my easel mm -hmm. so yeah. at any point i can just stand in the middle of my studio grab something go to wherever i'm painting yeah. grab something move it here yeah mm -hmm. rather than being rather than having to go all over the place yeah yeah um, and again it just helps with being in flow state of like ah oh, i need this thing i didn't know i would need i know it's yeah. i lean over here and i can get it yeah. yeah do you often like would you draw on a canvas before you paint it or are they uh, kind of do you do drawing and painting kind of separately kind of separately i don't really like to draw on the canvas before i go onto it yeah unless it's you know like one of those hero pieces of a gallery where it's like yeah i know that the traffic light i paint in this has to be exactly here right. yeah for my own little secret yeah yeah narrative reasons yeah, yeah. um so those are the ones where i'll measure it up by rule of thirds and like do yeah. that. No, the most I'll normally do is just do up the rule of thirds grid yeah, and yeah. work from there. I definitely work best under the ethos of like over preparation is key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like I'll I would rather draw the same thing that I want to paint seven times on paper so that I know when I go to paint it, I can just, you know, exactly where it to do it. Yeah. Uh, whereas when you like sketch too much onto the canvas, you can't deviate from that. Yeah, right. So I like to allow myself the opportunity for chaos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very Welcome good. chaos in. Mm. It's definitely a, a good artistic mindset, I think. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think particularly with um, like photography and videography a lot, you get lost in that clinical kind of, you know, I have to get it to look this certain way or yes. um, I'm going to do a super staged shoot. Yes. But yeah, I think a lot of people lose interest in photography because they fall into that kind of, I have to plan it all. It has to be a yes. high fashion shoot and yes. I have to have this and that. Well, again, like taking away the perfection. Yeah. Like your most interesting work comes when there isn't perfection and when there is a bit of chaos and you've made a decision on the fly that could make or break whatever yep. you're making. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Because people can see that as well and so when they see a perfect photo like i when i see a perfect photo shoot i'm always like oh cute 
Yeah, cool. It's mm -hmm. a great photo, great costume, but when I see a photo shoot that is very clearly like, oh, someone made some choices to <laughs> yeah. on the spot. Someone, that's where it's like. Someone woke up feeling frisky. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's where I'm like, this is interesting because you've yeah. captured the experience of making it. You're yeah. not making it to make a product. You're capturing a moment of making it and showing us that. Yeah, right. Because again, if I want a product, I'll go to a shop. Yeah. But if I want an experience, I'll go to an artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's definitely something that's um, impacted your work? Is that yes. you want to provide experiences over? Yes. Yeah. That was definitely a turning point in my work when like, I was feeling burnt out because I was just trying to make product, product, product. Yeah. What's going to look good? What's going to sell? What are people going to look at and go, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then when I shifted to more this idea of like, what's going to make someone feel something? Mm. Or like, how how can I put these three canvases in a certain order and tell different stories? Yeah. Which again is why I don't like to reveal on Instagram before real life. Cause it's like, I want to see someone see it and study their reaction and see, see how that makes them feel. Yeah. See what experience they get from it. Mm. And with give or take five minutes left, mm -hmm. what would be your, <laughs> I'm not ready. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Enjoy. <laughs> I believe in you. You can finish it after the show, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be your number one thing that you would say to someone who is either thinking about or just starting a professional career in visual arts? Uh, you get what you put in. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Uh, I, I, think, I feel like it's fairly self-explanatory. but Yes. I, um, I very much when I was younger, had the idea that a lot of artists have, and it's not the artist's fault for having this idea, where it's like, I'm doing all this amazing work and I love it and why is no one appreciating it? Yeah. And it's like, because it's not enough to just sit down and do the work and expect people to fall in love with it. They're not going to make the leaps and bounds you have to make it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the most valuable lesson I learned was like, if I don't put you know, X amount of hours into this, I'm not going to get X amount of reward. Yeah. And like, that's why I moved to a research based practice. Because it's like, if I don't put 8,000 words of research into this, I'm not going to have a strong message. Yeah. Mm. And so, yeah, it's definitely, yeah, knowing your limits of like how much is too much and when you need to stop. Yeah. But more importantly, knowing like, what am I willing to put into this to make it succeed? Yeah, right. That's and standing by that. Yeah. It's the, the um, give and take mm -hmm. of being an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, the other thing is, yeah, boundaries. Yeah. Uh, again, another theatre technique, distancing of like keeping yourself separate from the character you're playing. Yeah. It's the same thing with art is like, you know, know when to pull back. Yeah. Know when you're going in too deep. Yeah. Uh, tortured artist tropes don't work in real life. Well, yeah, they don't exist in real life. It's all yeah. hearsay. Yeah. Like dead artists who people call tortured artists were just people trying to live yeah. and trying mm. to make work. And so don't think you have to push yourself into these dangerous experiences or this dangerous life to feel something for your work. Yeah. That's a myth. Like look after yourself first, otherwise the work will suffer. Yeah. Van Gogh was amazing, but also if you had to actually live his life, you would not be having a fun life of being an artist. <laughs> you would be <laughs> making art in between moments of extreme trauma. <laughs> it would just be a lot of pain and a lot less fun. Yeah. yeah. Look yeah. after yourself first and the work will sort itself out. Yeah. And so as you're finishing your painting, mm -hmm. what are your what is your final steps to making it? to making it done at what point are you like okay this is this is finished now uh add chaos embrace chaos is always my trigger phase making art so yeah. at the very end of a painting i look at it and i think what is one thing i can do that is absolutely chaotic and could ruin it oh how I do like i that. bring that's how what do i, I just bring, did yeah and i saw you do that i was gonna make a comment i was like <laughs> yes he's getting it yeah, <laughs> i'm arting so it's like, you know, how do I breathe some life back into this after it's been a whole process of problem solving? Yeah. So now I'm just going to make a decision. I love it. Green. I'm stealing your green. Go on. I'm not using it anymore. I'm, I'm done. in the zone. <laughs> He's hit the flow state. I've hit the flow state. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting yellow. 
I'm actually stoked on mine. This is sick. Yeah, yeah. it looks dope. <laughs> I'm like pleasantly surprised. I've been doing a couple of Bob Ross, uh, yeah, so. Bob Ross painting videos over the past couple of weeks. I'm definitely no longer the artist I was. No. I'm very I'm a new man. Happy with mine. Yes. <laughs> oh, this is the wrong colour for this painting and I love it. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, sick. Mm -hmm. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. Wow. You look like a snake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that is, ac that is so cool. That's and I, I feel it's accurate to my yesterday, today, tomorrow feeling. Yeah. yeah. Arched, ready to pounce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go? I, this is, I'll show my art to the, to oh, the yeah. camera. This is mine. I've um, got a hair on it, actually. There we go. <laughs> um, I've got my, my beard in there with some paint splatters. Uh, and I also feel it's accurate to my uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow. Yeah. Yours yeah, looks like mine. it's been skinned. <laughs> yeah, it I love look. it. I really enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Show mine's the camera. a little more conservative, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's more conceptual. Yeah. I like yours. Yeah. Yours is cool. I'm very happy with it. I, I love how different our paint strokes anything are. Anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, we all went very different routes. Yeah. I love very it. Very exciting. Beautiful. Very cool. All right. Well, super happy. Micah, do you want to plug your stuff? Yeah. Look into yes. that camera, middle camera, or the right camera, whichever one you want. Um, I have a lot of things on the go that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> oh. uh, but you can keep in touch on my Instagram, micah.rusticelli. Um, there'll be some exciting announcements coming soon. Um, some more shows in the works, but in the meantime, I have my book, Sketchbook Volume 1, which is available through my website, micarossicelli.com, and I am beginning the process of Volume 2. Ooh, Ooh, very exciting. So make sure you get your hands on Volume 1 now, because I'm not sure if I'm going to make it a limited run or do a restock with the second volume. So this Sheesh. might be your only chance to get it, but I'm not making any promises. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Um, I'll link all of that in the description as well, um, so mm. that people can find that. Awesome. Do you have anything you want to say right before we finish up? This has been a wonderful and positive experience with The Fro Show. I'm very happy I did this. Beautiful. Oh, I'm um, glad. No, to... it's been great. I've had fun. I love to talk while I'm painting, so I'm glad you set this up. Awesome. Yeah, we really... thought it was a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, we thought it'd be fun. Um, cool. All right. Well, to finish up, we have a little bit of a tradition with guests. Uh-huh. Um, at the end of every show, we say bye. So we go bye, bye, bye. Yep. Um, like Backstreet Boys. Yep. Um, yep. Now, <laughs> what we like to do is we have the last person say the last bye, which is our guest. Yeah. So it'll go like this. I'll say bye. Yeah. Joe will say bye. Yeah. And then you'll say bye. Yeah. And then you get to press this button right there. The pink one? The pink one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. okay. So get yeah. In, you can get in position. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You ready? Yes. Okay. I'm going to do my finishing spiel and yep. then we'll start the bye and you'll know when to go. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Fro Show. Um, we hope you have a great week and enjoy it and come back next week. Check out Mike on all of his stuff. He's a phenomenal artist and we had a great time having him on the show. Mm -hmm. If you want to give us money, go to patreon.com slash The Fro Show. Michael also has a Patreon that you should check out. Um, there's some really cool stuff there and it's well worth the money. Um, thank you so much. See you next week. Bye. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well done, you nailed that. Yeah. Oh, I'm a podcaster now. You yes. are? Yeah, put that on your resume. I'm a podcaster. <laughs>